right, so what we're looking at is Palm Sunday, obviously, the, the Sunday before where Jesus rode in to the city of Jerusalem. A few things before we get into it, that John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. During the actual Passover, people were to take a lamb and they were to slay that lamb. They were supposed to put the blood on the doorpost of their house and on the top of the, the doorpost there. And it was in, really in the shape of a cross if you could connect the drips and then the three spots of blood. And it would turn into the shape of the cross. But a lamb had to be sacrificed in order that those in the household would be saved or protected because they were under the blood, as it were. And, and so this is what um, Passover actually refers to. But one of the things that is somewhat obscure is when they were to choose their Passover lamb, it was to be perfect, an innocent little lamb. And that lamb was invited into the house to be inspected. And it was invited into the house so they would make sure that it was worthy enough to be that lamb that would protect them from the angel of death. And as that lamb was brought into the house, think about bringing a little lamb into your house. We have a little puppy right now. My daughter got a puppy, and she's trying to move into her new home in, in Houston, and so we've had the puppy. And as big as, of a rascal as that puppy is, that puppy is just so darn cute. And you fall in love with the character of this puppy, but the puppy doesn't have that character. He's just a, she's just a rascal all the time. <laughs> and you imagine just a pure, spotless little lamb running around. And, and to be inspected, really, to be a sacrifice, ultimately. And it really is meant to hurt as well to understand that your sin was so devastating. It's not just a joke, that it, that it does hurt, that it is painful, and, and, and that something innocent has to die because your sin was so real, so hurtful to God that the wages of sin is death. And, and, and so as Jesus comes in in this day, he's following that design perfectly. He's, he's entering in to the house, as it were, to be inspected. And he has many confrontations during this week with those in authority. They're inspecting him. And he ends up being the lamb of God that can take away the sins of the world. He is that spotless lamb. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 19, verse 28. And it reads, And when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. Now Jesus had just given the parable of the minus and the parable of the coins or the parable of the payment, the salary. And it was a very serious warning to be a profitable servant. And you may willfully choose to serve the Lord, but the Lord has invested in you. And the idea is, are you going to be a profitable servant? Are you going to be a selfish servant? Or are you going to be an unprofitable servant? And this was, these were serious words that he brought. And he says this to those that were following him. Now, it is also interesting in this passage, we're going to see several different types of people, those that seem to be following and aren't following, those that are opposing and won't follow, and those that actually follow the Lord. And in this, you're going to see that there's those that think they're actually serving the Lord, but they're really serving themselves in a religious structure. And they're going to serve somebody. Do you guys realize that when God created us, he created us for his good pleasure? He created us to worship him. And you ever wonder why in our world we always have this crazy desire to put up heroes? We have this crazy desire to, to have superstars, don't we? And we are made to worship. And so we are going to worship something. And no one ultimately is truly free because we all have these desires that drive us. But where are we going to place that worship? Where are we going to place that desire? And I'm going to talk about a great philosopher from the 60s for a moment, Bob Dylan. Now, Bob and I, no, just kidding. Uh, last time I was talking to Bob, 
Well, anyways, Bob <laughs> Dylan wrote three Christian albums. And in one of them, the album called Saved, he wrote this song. These are just some of the lyrics. But he says, you may be an ambassador to England or to France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world, and you may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And so... The truth is, you're going to serve somebody. And the first thing we see here is interesting because often I liken myself to a donkey, <laughs> kind of stubborn and wanting to do things my own way and not so bright and all. But what we have here is Jesus saying, go into the village opposite you where you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And so this donkey has masters. And then this donkey is going to have a new master. He's trading masters. And one is okay, but he gets to be this donkey that brings the creator of the universe, sustainer of all things, into Jerusalem. And so it's interesting. Even the donkey is like from one place to another, from one Lord, as it were, to another. Now, what this looks like is Jesus is coming up to Jerusalem in all reality, the Mount of Olives is higher than Jerusalem. We'll see that in a picture later. But you actually look down onto the Temple Mount. But whenever you say up to Jerusalem, it's on a high ridge. It's not the highest place in the country, but it is a high ridge. And it is the high place spiritually. So they're always saying go up to Jerusalem. For some, it was literal, though. If you were to live near the Sea of Galilee, you would just travel down the Jordan River Valley, which goes to 1,200 feet below sea level. And you would get across from Jerusalem, and then you would start to climb up in these wadis or these, these valleys. And these valleys are desert. This is what they call wilderness in the Bible. It's the desert, not wilderness like a bunch of trees. And you would actually climb from 1,200 feet below sea level to at least 3,000 feet above sea level. And so you were truly going up to Jerusalem. They have a lot of psalms, which are called the Psalms of Ascents. And they would sing these as they go to the festivals that they would attend each year. The, the men were required to attend there in Jerusalem. And so many would be traveling this road. So he tells them how to secure the donkey. Verse 31 goes on, it says, And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to them, because the Lord has need of it. But those who were sent, who, who sent, went their way and found it, just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners or the lords of that colt said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Now again, just to develop this picture a little bit more, this colt is in bondage and doesn't really have a choice, and then it's loosed, it's set free to serve another. But it's set free to serve another. And the interesting thing, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is many who view Christianity, and perhaps someone that are listening today on the internet or the radio, many view Christianity as a, as a binding upon their life. It's something that holds them back. And I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I can't do the other. Instead of a loosening or a freeing. And the thing is, that's how you view it before you give yourselves to it. And if anybody truly gives their heart to Christ, if you're eight years old, you think, why didn't I do this when I was seven? <laughs> that's the freeing or the loosening you have when you truly give your heart to God that freedom. And so this, this wild animal that hasn't had anybody sit on him yet, which when I was in sixth grade, we used to go to a boys' camp. And at that boys' camp, we would jump on donkeys, and they would always buck us off into the dirt. We thought it was the best thing ever, right? <laughs> Being bucked off a donkey into the dirt, and we just loved it. We would kick them, and we would try to get them to buck us off because that was just a badge of honor. But they're not always... So ruly, they're unruly animals, but it's also awesome to see that even as he calmed the sea, he did calm the colt that he sat on. No one had ever sat on this colt before. And so these lords of the colt loosed that colt to be under another lord. 
Verse 35, it says, Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. They're recognizing that this isn't just some small event. They're thinking, this is a big deal. They're so excited about it. There's so much expectation, but much of that expectation is wrong expectation. You see, they're under great oppression from the Romans during this time. The the scriptures are pointing to this being their time of their visitation. They should be looking for the Messiah. But since they're being oppressed by the Romans, they're thinking that their Savior, their Messiah, at this point in time is coming to save them physically instead of spiritually. But he's truly coming to save them spiritually, but they're not recognizing that. And so continually, even the disciples themselves would think physically and not spiritually, and they would get Jesus' messages wrong until they were finally filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And so they're recognizing this is a special time, and, and we're not going to let Jesus even touch this dirty colt. We're going we're to put our clothes down. We're going to honor him with our own clothes. Now, at the same time, a week later, how do you think they would have been thinking about this? Let's just say it's Saturday. Jesus is in the grave. They're hiding for fear of their life. They just saw the most horrible thing anybody could ever see. They could be looking at this and saying, what in the world were we thinking? Not only did they kill him, but we enabled them to do it. Why didn't we stop him? They could imagine that they had done the wrong thing. And we can get caught up in these what ifs, can't we? Things happen, why didn't I? What if I would have? And we fall into this trap. But we need to understand that God always has a plan. He always has something going on that we can't see, that we're very limited in our person, in our intelligence, in our vision of the past and the future, but God knows all things. You see, even while they were hurt for a short time while Jesus was in the grave before they saw the resurrection, they could have been regretting this very act of treating him honorably, like we just offered him up as a sacrifice. It's our fault. But again, Jesus' death on the cross wasn't a tragic accident. It was the very reason he had come to the planet. He came to die in our place and to pay the price for our sins. As people look back on history, many times people will become Jewish haters. Oh, you put our our Lord to death. In all reality, the Romans put our Lord to death. Right? In all reality, it wasn't the Romans either. It was us. Because if we didn't sin, he wouldn't have had to go to the cross. And so... Jesus freely gave his life for us. People were involved in God's plan. They were pawns in God's plan. But it was his plan that he would die for the sins of the world. Again, John 1, 29, John the Baptist, a prophet, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in that culture, when you think of a perfect little lamb, what do you think? sacrifice it's a sacrifice just like on passover this is the passover season you know and and there he is the lamb of god and so not every tragedy is as tragic as it seems sometimes we don't seem to have an answer this side of heaven sometimes we're going to have to wait to get into heaven to figure out what god is doing but god is always doing something because most things are more than what they seem at the time. So Romans 8, 28, it's sometimes overused, but it's really not ever overused, right? Because it's something we always need to keep at the front of our mind. All things work together for the good for those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. And I think in my life, my wife and I, we're we're certainly me. I was raised in a Christian home with Christian parents who were married and And I graduated high school, graduated college, had never really had a hard time finding a job and and all. And our life was going well. The church was planted and and had some respect. We had a radio station and I would go and speak at conferences every now and again. And life was good. And then my wife showed up pregnant at age 40. 
And we were so excited to have this baby we had, but we had had to have C-sections. And so we had a C-section scheduled for a week later, but a week before that, our child had died. In my wife's womb, and we think, well, why didn't we just schedule it a week before? It was perfectly viable then. Why not? Why not? Why not? You can go through all these things, but I don't do that. Because I know that God knows. As soon as I heard that my son had died in my wife's uh, womb, I re- the, the Lord gave me this peace, and it seemed as audible as anything could be, and it was, you're going to be okay. And my response was, you knew this was coming, and you're telling me I'm going to be okay. And it's going to be a long road to healing, but you're going to be okay. It's been 15 years. I'm okay. But God knew for me and for my wife what we needed. And we also have the hope that we're going to see our son someday. But for me, my vocation, my life's work, my calling and my gifting is to walk people through the trials of life. This is what I do. And I don't understand everybody's unique trial because everybody has unique trials. But I do understand pain at the deepest level because that's not the same pain that you've experienced. It's a different pain. But it's like not pain 101. It's advanced doctoral study pain in an academic sense. And God has done incredible things in me because I could be compassionate to a certain level with people going through hurts, but now I know how to groan. And now I can share in people's pain from a standpoint of understanding advanced level pain. You know, I praise God for that. I don't praise God that I don't have a 15-year-old son. Maybe I would. I don't know, but he's not here. (laughs) But I'm going to see him again someday. But God, even in the worst of pain, God did incredible things in my life. He made me so much more different than the very next verse says, that you may be conformed into the image of Christ. That's the good thing that he did. And we need to remember that. And certainly, The cross is the pinnacle of that. You have Mary watching her son, who's never blown it, take out the trash. He'd always take out the trash. Stop fighting with your sister. She'd never have to tell him to do that because he wasn't ever fighting with his sister. She might be fighting at him, (laughs) but he was never fighting with her in a sinful way, ever. Tough older brother to have, I would say. (laughs) Gotta have compassion on his his, uh, younger siblings. Why can't you be like Jesus? Uh, uh, (laughs) I can't. But anyways, this is the pinnacle. The most innocent to have ever lived and also the creator, sustainer of all things, the one that all things were made for, the purpose for any existence whatsoever, the purpose for every sunrise, for every sunset, for every beautiful thing that ever takes place on earth, for every plant that ever grows is Jesus. And we killed him. But what does that mean? It means that we get to live. We get to live forever in his presence beyond description. Our brains can't even begin to conceive of those things that are waiting for those that love him. And even beyond that, in verse 36, it goes on. It says, and as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. So they're just jumping in. They're trying to honor him. They're giving him the red carpet treatment, as it were. They brought palm branches, John tells us, which is a symbol of victory for a returning general. So here we have this victorious king riding into the city that he's rescuing, but he's riding in on a donkey. Now, if you want to come in and conquer and be impressive, what do you do? You ride a war steed. You ride a big old horse. Could you imagine being in Central Park on a busy Sunday afternoon and some cop rides up on a donkey? (laughs) Impressive. Better listen to you, buddy, as he's like trying to hold on because it's unruly and wants to do what it wants to do. No, they ride powerful horses and they're meant to impress. 
But if a king wanted to come in and show that he was bringing peace, he would ride in on a donkey, saying, I'm not here to make war physically. I'm here to bring peace. And that's what Jesus did. He came in with palm branches, riding in on a symbol of humility and peace. Verse 37 goes on and it says, And then, as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. And so, this just breaks my heart because we were supposed to be in Israel like two weeks ago. (laughs) But if you ever get to go with us, which I hope will happen next year, that's our prayer, you'll probably sit here and This wasn't here in Jesus' day, but this is a view from the top of the Mount of Olives, and right here is the Temple Mount. And the temple would have been right around where that uh, Muslim uh, tomb is, actually. And uh, down here is the city of David. And then Jerusalem would have been stretched out this way and a little bit over here, not as so big with skyscrapers back then. But this is a high place, and as you go down, you have to be careful because right to the right of this are the paths that go down somewhat near where Jesus would have walked as he, as he came into the city, as they were uh, waving the, the palm fronds and they were laying out their clothes in front of him. And it's, it is very steep, and it's interesting, too. At the bottom here, oops, all these trees right down here, these are, these are olive gardens, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of the Olive Press is right down there. And so these are places he would camp. This is the place that he, pray, he prayed and he was arrested on the night that he was betrayed. And so they would have camped there because they knew people that had olive groves down there. And so, so this is sort of what it looks like, uh, but you have to back yourself up a few millennium. <laughs> and so he would descend and they're, they're starting to praise him. Now it says there that the whole multitude of disciples or followers. Now, all these followers are not true followers. But they began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Now, John tells us that this raising of Lazarus was a part of the reason for the red carpet treatment and all the palm branches. It says in John 12, 17, Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. And so they're seeking him for what they can get out of him in the flesh, not in the spirit. They're not recognizing him as a fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophets. They're not seeing him as a fulfillment of all the symbolism of all the sacrifices, even what the priest wore, and all the ceremonies and festivals, everything in the Old Testament in their religion pointed to Jesus. They saw the signs and they were thinking, Candy man, I can get what I want. Maybe he'll give me a miracle. Maybe I can catch some fish and get some coins out of their mouths or whatever it might be. And they're seeking the spectacular. Now, the thing is, God can do spectacular things, can't he? But we follow Jesus. We don't follow miracles. Miracles may or may not follow us. Either way, I'm going to follow Jesus for for what he did, his great sacrifice on the cross. That is the incredible thing. And so they're thinking, man, nothing is impossible with God, and he rose the dead, and he's, he's going to do something for me as well. But the truth is, these people were believing for a miracle. They weren't believing for salvation. And we need to make sure that our faith is steadfast on those specific promises of God. Because we see miracles happen, and so many people are motivated by the miracles. But the promises of God that are sure are, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. There's no wiggle room in that promise. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. There's no wiggle room in that. There's no middle ground. There's no game playing. And so many people play games with God, and they they seek the residue instead of God himself. They seek what he, he may do instead of who he is. And who he is is sure, and those promises of salvation are the surest thing that we can hold on to. Now, we may want God to make our problems magically disappear. 
But the question is, what if he wants me to grow through difficulty? Which he does. When things are going fine, guys, we're not learning a whole lot. I just hate to tell you that. When things get tough is when we actually learn and we actually grow. I asked earlier in our servant service, well, how, how are we to grow? Not how do we grow, but how are we to grow? What are we to grow in? Riches? Fame? We can grow in those things, but we all grow old, so we can't grow physically more fit year after year. We can maybe back it up a little bit here and there, but that's it. You go on a diet for a few months, right? How are we to grow? Listen, we are to grow in faith, in trusting that God is who he said he is, did what he said he did, and will do what he said he will do. Faith, trust in who he is. And two, we are to grow into his character. We are to grow in faith and we are to grow in his character. Character is eternal. I always say when I get into heaven, I want to hit the ground running. I don't want to show up by the hairs of my chinny chin chin with smoking, right? Like it's all gone, like I barely made it in. I want to hit the ground running in heaven. My maturity here is my starting point there. And I want to start running. I want to be on a sprint to, to, to learn more about God. And, and so this is the character that he desires to build in us, the side of heaven. And what can he do with that character? He can bless other people with it. He can draw more people to himself. And he can give us more satisfaction as that character causes us to live more like him. And for us, that's incredibly satisfying. Who would have thunk that as a believer... You give away something generously that you love and you're more blessed by giving it away than keeping it. That is so against nature, isn't it? It's so against who we are, but this is the nature God has given us. He says it's better to give than to receive. What about rejoicing with someone who's rejoicing even though you might be hurting at that time and saying, praise God. I have pastor friends around this city and Every so often, we become the flavor of the month. <laughs> and we, one church will grow, and the other church isn't growing. Away. It's just weird. It just happens that way. People can be fickle. But when one church is growing, I've learned over the years to say, well, praise God. You love God. You love God's people. You love God's word. Praise God. I rejoice with you. And I recognize, finally, I'm able to actually rejoice with the success of who, in a worldly sense, would be my competition. And it brings me incredible joy to do so. I never thought that could be true, but it is true, rather than resentment, frustration, and jealousy. And and so God wants us to grow, and most of the time our growth is through difficulty. And so even as they're looking at the cross, they're going, oh, this can't be good, and you know what? It was the best thing ever in all of history. And so as these people are are, are shouting, verse 38, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called out from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. I think they were the rolling stones. Now, as he drew near... He saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Let's first look at verse 42. We'll go backwards a little bit here, but verse 42. He says, in this your day, your day, you should have known. You guys are the religious leader. You're the Pharisees. You're the guys that are the scribes. You're the ones that are the, the conservatives. You're all about it. Here you are. This is your day. You're Jews. Your Jewish Messiah has now come. And if you would have known it, you'd have incredible peace, but you missed it. They would have known, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. From the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there should be seven 
weeks and 62 weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. What is he saying? He's giving a time frame. And as you break it down, this ends up being, in their language, 483 years. There was a decree that came in Nehemiah chapter 2 to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And if you measure that out in how they measured ancient years until the Messiah shows up, you know what? It turns out that it's this day. It's nailed. God gave that prophecy to Daniel over 500 years earlier. And it turns out that this is the day that your Messiah, he enters in to Jerusalem on that day. And so he's looking at them and he's saying, if you would have known. You need to understand that those that are in the flesh are spiritually blind. You can study the Bible from a standpoint of intellect. You can study it for its poetry, for its history. But the things of the Lord are spiritually discerned. And so you can have someone with the lowest IQ who gave their heart to God, but spiritually they are more intelligent than the person with the highest IQ who rejects God. And so these men were after the flesh. If you seek, you will find. They truly were not seeking. They were using their religious facade as a means of profit, as a means to gather power, as a means to gather fame. They didn't recognize truly God. And he's saying, if you would have recognized, you even know the scriptures by memory. Little Jewish boys had to memorize huge passages of the scriptures. If you had known, especially in this day, the things that would make for your peace. You missed it. Zechariah wrote 550 years earlier, Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And here comes Jesus riding on a donkey. They knew the verse, and they're not seeing exactly what's happening in front of their face. They are spiritually blind. In many ways, they just don't want to see it. The psalmist even wrote the script that the, that the crowd was following. The stone which the builders had rejected had become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, Hosanna, is what they're saying. Save now, O Lord, O Lord, I pray. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. This is a day. Save now, Hosanna. And they are actually spontaneously singing this song as Jesus comes in. And many of them didn't believe. But the prophecy absolutely, 100%, came true. These Pharisees would have known the significance. In fact, I think they understand the significance. They're just rejecting the significance because they're saying, that's reserved for the Messiah, and there's no way that this man riding on a donkey, coming in peace, rejected, born in Bethlehem, from Nazareth, I'm just on and on and on. What were the rumors about his childhood? Born of a virgin, they would say. You got to... Oh, wait. So they were spiritually blind. It wasn't a matter of intelligence. It was a matter of surrender. And they were not willing to surrender to God that they might see and have the scales removed from their eyes. You can ignore these prophecies, but Jesus fulfilled in his lifetime as he lived in the flesh incarnate over 300 Old Testament prophets 
prophecies specifically. And he says, if the people did not cry out, the stones would cry out. Again, the first rock band. There you go. I wish we could have seen it. (laughs) But God promised to send his Messiah. Praise must happen. We praise him for what he has done. We praise him for who he is. He is great. He is merciful. He is wise. He is just. He is sacrificial. He is giving. He's protective. He's loving. At the moment, it's hard to go, oh, praise you, Lord, for the chaos that the world's going through, isn't it? But we can still praise him for who he is. Verse 43, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave you, leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. It tells me there was an option here. We don't know what history would look like had the Jews received Christ at that moment. But one thing's for sure, they would not have had the Romans absolutely wipe them out in 70 AD and actually turn all the stones of the temple off and roll them into the valley so much so that there's no temple there today and they actually don't know exactly where it stood. Even though the temple mounts there, they have no idea exactly where the temple stood. It was so wiped out. So their Messiah had come. He had ridden into their city as promised on the day that it was promised, and they missed it. Do you know the time of your visitation? As we come in contact with Christ, there's always a choice. There's a choice for the unbeliever. Some theologies believe that there's a prevenient grace that is, appears in someone's lives just a few times during their life. And during that time, they can accept Christ because God has bestowed grace upon them. Others, like myself, believe from the time they're born, God's drawing them. <laughs> and they have that opportunity either until their heart becomes so hard that they live as a dead man on earth or they die. So there's different theologies. I don't argue those theologies anymore. We have our different ideas. God does what he does. But they had the opportunity and they missed it. So every time you come in contact with Jesus Christ, what are you going to do with it? Someone's 50 years old. They've lived through 50 Easter seasons where Christ is in our face in America. But what would Paul say about that? Paul would say today is a day of salvation. Today is a day of salvation. I would say for us as believers, though, there's also a choice. Every time we confront Christ, what are we going to do? Are we going to surrender to him for that day or not? We also have that choice every time we confront the Lord. Are we going to allow him to be our Lord? I'm not talking about him being your Savior full time. Are you going to allow him to be your Lord Master that day? Present yourselves as a living sacrifice. Don't squirm off the altar. Say, God, here I am. I was locked up to this master. I didn't realize I was locked up many times. But now involuntarily I'm loosed and now you are my master. What am I going to do with you today? So even for us, the, today is a day of salvation, as Paul would say. Behold, now is the accepted time. And I would say for us as believers, now is the accepted time to surrender once again. How many times do you have to surrender in your life? as a believer. I don't know, to be useful and happy and full of joy as many times as you pull away from God. I can't count that high. It might be higher than our new deficit. I don't know. It's pretty big for me. But I need to confront Christ often and surrender and say, you are my Lord. Not just my Savior, but you are my Lord every day. So how will you respond to Jesus. So this donkey has changed masters. Prayerfully, I have changed masters as well. But now my master is benevolent. I've been set free. He has ridden me. He has, he has calmed me. He has made me useful. He has made me purposeful. He has given me great joy. Many people view God as a burden until they come to know him. 
People always say, well, if you're a Christian, you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do the other. And I'm like, I don't have to do that. Paul said all things are permissible, but not all things are profitable. I can do that and still be saved. I just don't want to do that. I'm set free. It was interesting. I was standing behind a woman in Walmart the other day, and I was, it was kind of weird because I was on my box, right? I was in my square. <laughs> and she, someone was in the line in front of her, and she was giving them like eight feet. And she kept on looking at me like mad dogging me. And I'm like, lady, I'm in my square. I'm all good. <laughs> so she goes ahead. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was just funny. You know, I'm following the rules, right? But she's, the interesting thing about it, she's wearing a face mask. She's wearing something over her head and she's wearing something on her body. Like, she's full nuclear meltdown ready, okay? She's, she's going straight into the lab with the live virus. <laughs> I mean, it, she goes up there, and she orders a pack of cigarettes. And I go, oh! <laughs> From possible death to sure death, it was just amazing to me. And I kind of chuckled, and she looks at me, and, she, and, I, and I, I was, I am so sorry. And I, I didn't say anything after that, you know, but she thought because she ordered a particular type of cigarettes that most people don't smoke, I guess. I don't know. I've never smoked, you know. So I just, I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm just, <laughs> it was just amazing to me, right? But it's like that, you know, in the world, you just trade one master to another master to another master looking to be healed or set free or whatever until you come to Christ. And he's the one that finally sets you free. But you're sure there's something else out there, right? You're sure there's a better way. Until you come to Christ, you're like, oh, finally, I figured it out. He saved you. You didn't really necessarily figure it out. It's just, you, <laughs> he showed up, right? But that's Satan's lie. You want to surrender, you, you know, it's like, I'm going to surrender control of my life. He'll change me. Yeah. When I, when I present Christ to people, they're like, well, well, I go, yeah, your whole life will change. But you'll like it. It's okay. You'll love it. I remember being a little kid and not really understanding the Christian thing. And I, 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 would, I would sit in services, and I hated when the missionaries visit. You guys are thinking, oh, pastor, you're always bringing missionaries to talk to us. Yes. I love missionaries. And, and, and so, but when I was young, it's like, oh, no. They're going to try to convince me to live in the middle of Africa. You know, I was, I was afraid. And then when I caught fire with the Lord at age 24, that's what I wanted to do. Yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I was on a phone call with about 15 Brazilians that are pastors in Brazil, and we, we helped plant a couple of those churches, and, and I'm looking at I love you guys. <laughs> you know, I just so, what? Like, that's the best thing ever. And if you talk to Wayne and Tammy Andrus, our missionaries in Kenya, that's where they want to be, man. Their heart beats for there. I talk to our missionaries from China. They're brokenhearted that they can't get back to their people. They're bummed. They're in Southern California. And they can't wait to get back to this little island off the coast of China. What God has for you is good. And it will change your whole life. But sometimes we, we, we think he's after us just to, to bum us out. The truth is he's not. He loves you. Story, quite a few years ago, a man had stolen a car. And when someone steals a car, it's a big deal, but it's not like all points, you know, everybody down, let's get this guy. But this particular, in this particular case, it was. You know, uh, uh, be on the lookout for when across every possible police group to catch this man. And, and, and he probably thought, oh no, they're after me for, to, to, to take me down. But the reason they were after him is the person who he had stole the car from had just doused a bunch 
of saltine crackers with poison to kill rats around his house and left them in the front seat of the car. Because, yeah, they'll deal with the law afterwards, but they're actually worried that his life, that he would die if he ate even one of those crackers. And they're sitting on the front seat. So they were chasing him for his good, but he thinks it's for their bad. And a lot of people think that about God. But he loves you so much. He does not want, one, the sins of this world to destroy you. And then for you to be punished for the sins in this world that you committed and be separated from him for all of eternity. That's not what he wants. God is a hound from heaven. He never forces you, but he keeps on chasing you and he keeps on wooing you and he wants to draw you in. And I remember talking to Hannah Overton when she was in prison. I used to tell her, it is not good for you to be here and you don't like it. But you do recognize that you're freer than those unbelieving guards that are guarding you, right? She goes, yeah. Because they're in bondage even though they're free. And Lord, the Lord wants to set us free. Listen to how God describes his disposition towards you. Zechariah 2.8, the, we are the apple of his eye. Even with someone you love, if they put their finger near your eye, you're like very protective, aren't you? It's even worse than that, the, our eye, because sometimes I'll wear contacts. And, and, and I, I, I don't wear them as much anymore because my glasses hide my wrinkles. But <laughs> anyway, so, but when you're trying to put in contacts, it's even hard for you to touch your own apple of your own eye. And that's how God protects and loves you. 1 John 3, 1, great is the love the Father has lavished upon us. Lavished, I love that idea of lavish, like going to a water park and having the, the, the big bucket filled with water and finally just dumping on you. <laughs> love to stand under that because I'm a guy. Girls don't like it as much, I don't know why, <laughs> but it's a boom, lavished, full. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no eye has seen nor ear heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Try thinking about heaven and you don't think awesome enough about heaven. You can never overthink heaven as far as its glory. You can't go there. It's beyond even description for those that have had a vision of it. John tries in Revelation, we'll see that, Paul refuses to even use all the words that he uses to describe it, right? And this is what the Lord has for us. In Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Are you tied up? Do you need to be loosed? You're gonna serve one master or another. The Lord asks us to, or we can be in bondage to another. Why would we want to live any other way? Why would people want to deny the Lord the opportunity of governing their lives? And Jesus is looking at it. He cries over the city and says, if you would only. And he begs, but I think he's still, the, the question is still out there. If you would only. If you would only. And even for us as believers, if you would only obey a little bit. Give me an inch. Give me the faith of a mustard seed. Step out in faith tomorrow. And the next day you might be able to double that faith. He rides into your life, humble as your savior, compassionate as your father, and how are you gonna respond? We're gonna go ahead and celebrate in communion in a moment, but let's go ahead and pray and prepare our hearts. Dear Lord, as we enter this season, of the celebration of your death and resurrection, Lord, may it be that if we're believers, Lord, we would just learn to absolutely surrender more and more and to believe deeper in you. But as it is, Lord, uh, there's many who think you're the bad guy. Lord, we just pray that you break through somehow, some way, supernaturally into lives during this hard time. 
as frustrating as this Easter season is because it's such an incredible time of gathering and we're told not to gather, Lord, may it be that you gather supernaturally beyond our ability to even conceive. You can do much more than we can think or imagine with your power that works. And so may your power work, we would pray, God. Set the captives free would be our heart, Lord. During this season, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.